sponsored by New Orleans Distillers, creators of fine spirits and liqueurs. Through dedication to science, art, and passion, blends of tradition and flavor emerge. For you, always locally crafted. New Orleans Distillers, classically Southern. Tonight, stock indexes and the first half of the year down. The S&P had their worst first half of the year not seen since 1970. And the Dow Jones Industrial Average had their worst first half of 2022 not seen since 1962. We've got that and more tonight on this Friday, July 1st, 2022. Hi, I'm Andre Laborde. Welcome to Wall Street Wrap Up on this 4th of July weekend. For Friday, July the 1st, I hope your week went well. Well, the end of the first half of 2022 ended on Thursday, and all the stock indexes ended in the red. That was bad, but maybe here's some stats that might make your 4th of July a little bit brighter. Now, to give some historical content, in 1932, the S&P was down over 45% going into July, and in 1962, it was down 23.5%, and in 1970, it was down 21%. Now, we did some research, and we found when the S&P 500 was down 15% or more in the first half of the year, as it was for this year, it gained 100% of the time in the second half of the year, with an average gain of 15 to 18%. Well, let's hope it's true this year as well. When well, this begins the 4th of July weekend, and AAA is predicting that 3.5 million Americans are going to be flying for this weekend. Now, added to this, an estimated 48 million people are expected to hit the road for the 4th of July weekend. Now, the average cost of a flight this weekend has gone up 45 percent from 2019 to now it's about $437 a ticket. Now, that's even if you get to use the ticket. As of this evening, there's over 270 flights that have been canceled, and, and that's for the weekend. And added to that, an additional 2,000 flights are now delayed, and it's only Friday. Well, let's hope it doesn't happen more. Also coming up tonight, if you've got your money in mutual funds and with Wisdom Tree Investments, you won't want to miss our guest tonight. This evening, we've got Jeremy Schwartz from Wisdom Tree. Jeremy is the global chief investment officer at Wisdom Tree and oversees assets of over $75 billion of assets under management. If you've been seeing your monthly or quarterly statements go down, well, you're not alone. But We'll find out how much longer this carnage is going to last. Jeremy Schwartz from Wisdom Tree Investments. Jeremy's going to be with us in just a moment. But first, how did the markets do this week? Well, throughout the week, the market was in the red. But at the last couple of hours going into the 4th of July, all the indexes turned and headed positive going into the three-day weekend. They all ended in the green. This week, the Dow Jones ended at 31,097, and that was down for the week of about 1.3%. The S&P 500, they closed at 3,825, which was down just about 2.2% for the week. And the NASDAQ, they ended at 11,127, which was down about 4.1% for the week. Now, I know you get, we, I know we're getting near the bottom because analysts, once again, are issuing new price targets for stocks that have been hammered for the last six months of this year. Bank of America has put Meta Platforms, which is the old Facebook, as a buy with a new price target at $233 a share. Now, they've also stated that Goldman Sachs, within the next 12 months, is also a buy with a new price target at $380 a share. Well, let's get to our guest this evening. Jeremy, Jeremy Schwartz is the Global Chief Investment Officer at Wisdom Tree with over $75 billion of assets under management. Best of all, he's here with us tonight. Hi, Jeremy. Welcome to Wall Street Wrap Up. Thanks for having me. Great to be with you. I was just watching an interview recently, uh, actually this week, with Professor Jeremy Siegel. And he was saying that, although officially with the Bureau of Labor Statistics, that the... Um, that the inflation rate is at normally at 8.6 percent. He said, but really, it's it's between 12 and 15 percent. If you use, especially if you use the metrics that were the with BLS used to use. What are your thoughts? 
You know, I've been working with the, the great professor from Wharton for the last 20 years. We, we've been working since 2001. And, you know, he has been spot on on this Fed call for the last two years saying inflation was going to be hotter than expected, that they weren't properly accounting for the money supply, and the huge growth in money supply was going to feed out into inflation over time. Now, what I think he's talking about there, there's been a number of adjustments. There's composition adjustments to what goes into the CPI, how they measure it, what goods they track. One of the particular things is housing. So housing, the way they survey rent um, and owner's equivalent rent doesn't reflect that home prices were up 20 to 25 percent. Uh, and so they only were doing 3 to 5 percent increase in housing. That's a large component of the CPI. And, and we think that's going to bleed into the CPI over the coming months. And that's going to be things that keeps inflation elevated uh, more than the Fed would like. I've read an article recently this week in the Wall Street Journal that one of the reasons that housing is going up so much is because there are even uh, people who have sold their home before they go ahead and are able to buy a new home, whether or not they want to wait or whether they can't find one yet, they're renting. I mean, it's, it, it's going to be an interesting question. The, I mean, mortgage rates have doubled. And so the cost of a mortgage um, with housing prices up and mortgage rates up is dramatically higher. And so I think one of the big questions will be how much pressure do you get on home prices? Now, if you're somebody, so everybody's been talking about the home buyer who locked in at 3% for 30 years, who's really well off, right? Uh, people who did that a few years ago. But you know what's interesting? I, I was talking with one of my colleagues who's, who's actually moving to Denver and he's looking at buying a house, right? He's gonna rent for a few months and figure out where he wants to live. And if the prices come down because mortgage rates have gone up so much, who doesn't think that you'll be able to refinance in two years back at where you were, right? You know, so there is a silver lining for people who are still in the market who are going to, who can buy after there's some softness, you know, from these mortgage rates going up dramatically, uh, and then you can refinance later. So I think, I think that's something to look forward to if you're still looking to buy a home, uh, you know, you, you have to look forward to eventually a Fed cutting cycle after the next recession where you might be able to refinance the house at a, at a lower rate. And that goes exactly what I was talking about, Jeremy, was that like, so let's say your friend that's in Denver or people that, you know, they're, they've just moved for whatever reason or whatever. Uh, they've sold their house and they just want to rent for a while just to be able to make sure that they know before making that purchase and they'll be able to refinance. The Federal Reserve, uh, they raised 75 basis points, three quarters of a percent for the month of June. Well, now, uh, July 1st, we're, they're going to be having another, uh, another meeting coming up in, a, in another week or so, the Federal Reserve. And it's almost undoubtedly assured that they're going to be raising rates again. Do you think, curious your thoughts, do you think that they're going to be raising them three quarters of a percent? 75 basis points as last time in June? Or do you think that they may have to go a whole 1%? You know what? You, you've heard from how quickly things have changed. There was, you know, Powell was saying not so long ago that 50 basis points was the most appropriate. They weren't going to go 75. Mm -hmm. um, you actually had Siegel come out um, right before the June meeting and say, they should do 100 immediately and get it over with. Why this sort of slow drip campaign of 50 bips at a, at a clip? And it was amazing. By Monday, you know, expectations moved up and they did 75. You know, Powell is saying now, uh, this week he was in, at, a, at a monetary conference in Europe. He was on the stage with Christine Lagarde, the head of the ECB, the head of the Bank of England. Uh, the, and, and they were talking about the, the right path. And there's questions on, do you think the market is pricing in the right path? which includes 75 basis points at this late July meeting. Um, you know, and he's basically saying the market's got them figured out pretty much on point right now, that they are expecting to get to about 3.5% by the end of the year. to almost another doubling of rates. It's another seven hikes, essentially, 725 basis point hikes, and they've got four more meetings. Um, so the path I've seen is a 75, a 50, and 225s would be how I might see it playing out. Um, but they've said inflation is a key issue. They're they're taking steps to address it. You know, it's it's more important than heading into a recession. Uh, the fear is 
that they don't need to hike as much uh, to be as restrictive, which is why they probably would go 50 uh, after this next 75, uh, and then they could slow it down from there. But that, that's going to be the key question. Certainly, they're now worried about inflation more than they are worried about growth and, and a recession. Well, when they talk about soft landing as compared to hard landing, uh, a soft landing is being able to raise interest rates without having it, the country go into a recession. A hard landing is, is just the opposite, that the country would be going into a recession. If they go to, like what you're talking about, maybe by the end of the year, maybe 3.5% interest rates, do you think that that would, that would create a soft landing, that the country would not go into a recession? Or do you think we're going into a recession one way or the other. There's a number of people who say you might be in a mild recession right now. I mean, the first half year GDP growth is going to be negative. Including you had Professor a, a first said that this week. He's exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So a mild recession may be where you are exactly right now. Uh, and then the question is, how deep does the recession go? How much will unemployment come up? You know, how much will housing prices come down is one of the spillovers across? Those are all the big questions. Um, and it seems like the Fed is getting overly aggressive. Well, at least as you were mentioning before, because you were talking about, let's say, 75 basis points, three quarters of a percent next one. But you also you lowered it to like one half of a percent later and then maybe even a quarter percent toward the end of the year. That still gives Lee uh, some 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 cushion that they could also raise it from a half a percent to three quarters of a percent or the last one, let's say, going from a quarter of a percent yeah. to a half. That could also raise things if they if they so need when we are going into times like these, um, what about this type of stocks that you should own in your portfolio? Um, I'll give you an example, like when, in, when last year and the year before that and the year before that, when money was basically free, tech stocks and growth stocks were, were darlings because the, the, the lower the interest rate, tech flew. But now, all of a sudden, with interest rates rising, tech is really getting it on the chin. Um, do you think now is because tech people are, are dumping it. Uh, you know, they always say uh, buy when people are selling and sell when people are buying. Do you, because, of, because people are selling tech, is technology a good time to get into that sector? I, I would love to see some capitulation, what you call real selling. Uh, you can say, now, some of these stocks are down 70%. What do you mean there's not been real selling? But there's still a buy-the-dip mentality in some of the most speculative, high multiple growth stocks. And a lot of them are down three quarters, 80%, yet still at high multiples because they were even much higher multiples before. Uh, and, and sort of the unprofitable tech, the innovation crowd, there's still been a lot of inflows to those types of ETFs. I would like to see actually selling and redemption from those ETFs to say investors have capitulated. I, you know, I do think you are seeing some signs of like large cap tech becoming reasonable. And a lot of the value indexes are buying names like Meta and Facebook, uh, PayPal, um, Moderna, Illumina. There's a bunch of new stocks that were traditional growth stocks now beaten down so much that they've been added to value indexes. So that is an amazing a turn. Um, so there, are, you could say a number of the growth stocks are becoming more value-like, and they face that pressure. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I'd say some of the most speculative angles of growth, you know, the, the single most important factor this year has been, do you pay a dividend or not? High dividend stocks have been up on the year when growth is down 30%. There's been very large spreads between even traditional value strategies and high dividend-oriented value strategies. Well, stocks such as Morgan Stanley released an uh, announcement this week that they'll be raising their, their dividend. Um, I know Apple normally raises their dividend annually. They, they haven't announced that. But, um, and other uh, bank stocks are, have stated that they're going to be raising dividends. So do you think a, an area to go to right now during these times of inflation and also higher interest are stocks that are paying a, a higher yield? For sure, that's been the number one factor. Uh, and, you know, the average dividend growth over a very long period of time has been able to beat inflation. If you go back to the 50s when the S&P 500 started, inflation was around 3.6%. Dividend growth was 2% on top of that. It's one of the ways we say instead of buying inflation-protected bonds, what they call TIPS, you can buy dividend stocks that give you protection from inflation plus real growth on top of it. You could get baskets of stocks yielding 25 3%, higher dividend stocks yielding closer to 4%, that then 
gets growth on top of that. This year, just hot off the press, um, when the analyst at S&P said he sees dividend growth on the S&P 500 this year at 10 percent which is, again, keeping up with inflation, surpassing inflation, just like it did during the 70s and 80s when you had 6% inflation for two decades. Dividend growth beat that. Uh, you're seeing that play out again this year. And the, the way I also say, too, is that they're paying you to wait because they're paying you a, a yield, a dividend. So until the stock goes back up, they're paying you quarterly quarterly dividends. Pandemic stocks. You know, we it's uh, we're now out of the pandemic, uh, out of the lockdowns. People are going back to work, maybe not as fast as many employers are, are hoping to. Uh, but but people are now uh, moving up from their homes in back into the offices. Do you think stocks that were known as pandemic stocks? And I'm thinking of Zoom, uh, DocuSign, Netflix uh, and maybe some others yeah. like that. Do you think those will still have the luster that they had, say, just even one year ago? Well, there's each one has its own set of stories and earnings and valuations. I, you know, a number of those, and they're obviously way down from their highs. Um, the question on something like Zoom, I mean, the new there is a new world of, of hybrid work. I mean, I know personally, I'm not going back to the office. Anywhere near where I did before, my travel can be down 80, 90%. I'm doing so much more on Zoom. Zoom is, 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 is one of those stocks that I might call a value stock. I mean, it's come way down. So it's different than um, sort of the, when it was a mega growth stock, 80% higher, right? Or, or, or before it's 80% fall is what you'd say. Um, you know, Netflix has a lot of competition in the streaming standpoint, but also now largely what you consider a value stock. So people have become very pessimistic, but there's a lot of competition in that streaming war. So I, I think, you know, That'll be a challenge. Is can they grow their earnings? And again, um, but they're certainly no longer a very expensive stocks. Uh, certainly, the the valuations have have become much more attractive on on a lot of those growth stocks. Yeah. Well, things such as like you were talking about Netflix is that it used to be a six hundred dollar stock. Now it's trading under two hundred dollars, about a, about one hundred and seventy eight, one hundred and eighty dollars a share. So the value uh, is is very attractive if you're thinking about as being a, a long-term player? Or do you think that because there are so many streaming companies like Disney Plus, uh, Discovery Plus, um, and uh, all the others are, are getting into the market, that it'll fracture the market too much? It, well, it's expensive to compete for content. So there's, there's an issue of there's just more competition, bidding after more things. Uh, you know, they, they're taking some actions to try to stop the sharing of passwords, which was pretty, uh, you could say, endemic throughout their ecosystem. And, and so, you know, can they get some higher revenue growth by stopping that sharing? That's going to be one of the questions. Uh, will they raise prices to offset their cost increase? Those will be key questions. But there is a lot of competition. And so I think that's the extra earnings uncertainty right now is even more than being the sort of post-pandemic because there's just a lot of competition going after the same market. We're talking with Jeremy Schwartz. Jeremy is the global financial officer at Wisdom Tree. Don't go away. We'll be right back. Before we left, we were talking about uh, about the pandemic and, and such. Well, we're just finishing up the second quarter right now and going into the third quarter. So companies are going to be releasing their earnings from um, April, May, and June, coming up in, in the weeks ahead. Do you think that, and it's kind of like what we were talking about before, the, the, the government just... Uh, um, came out with new numbers that we had a 1.6 negative GDP loss for the first quarter. Well, do you think that they're going to be making their earning, companies will be making their earnings according to what analysts had predicted, or do you think that there'll be more misses than hits? I think going into the second half earnings season, the things I'm worried about, the strong dollar really hurts some of the multinationals. So I actually, and analysts are notoriously bad at reflecting the dollar and the currency. 
in their earnings estimates. So uh, you started to see a few companies like Microsoft warned that the strong dollar was going to erode some of the profits. They have. Um, and so that's one of the one of the issues. You know, will you see other the rise in commodity prices and other things, wages, uh, co- you know, that being a headwind on earnings. So there are a lot of headwinds on, on earnings, but it, it's, it's encouraging. First half was declining GDP and earnings growth held up. Uh, and I think you'll have a little bit more headwinds coming into the second half of the year. But, uh, you know, we're still expecting largely earnings to come in uh, in a positive direction. Jeremy, at Wisdom Tree, you have a, uh, you have a, a mutual fund that, that specializes in the cloud. And I'm curious, we, talked, we just touched briefly on tech stocks, but do you think that the cloud and stocks that, uh, that emphasize in, uh, in storage in the cloud, will that only be getting bigger as we go into the, into the, the 2023, 2024, 2025 years ahead? So, you know, we talked about high dividends as being the the, the positive uh, clouds, the opposite. I mean, there's there's call it 50 percentage points differential where cloud computing stocks are down almost 50 percent, 45 percent when when high dividend stocks are positive in the air. You couldn't have two more different ETFs than something like our high dividend U.S. basket versus the cloud. Cloud is you know, what. When you think about what's happening in the S&P 500, software keeps growing in the S&P 500. It's, it's got to be one of the top few sectors now. But the cloud stocks in that W Cloud ETF, WCLD, they're not in the S&P 500. They're sort of only a few of those, less than a handful of stocks there, 3% maybe of the 14% total are in the S&P 500. So they're the up-and-coming growers. I think there is a big transition to this cloud computing as the future of software. And so we see it as a, as a structural long-term growth area. When I think of cloud stocks, I think of, well, I, and I think of, let's say, the, the bigger ones. I'm thinking of Amazon that has AWS, or I'm thinking of Microsoft uh, that has their cloud. But you've also got a, a number of others, Snowflake and, and, and many others. Is it better to, to go ahead and invest in the smaller ones where you have more room for growth than more of the, well, more, I'll, I'll use the term more well-established, like AWS, which, was at, which is Amazon right. Web Services or, or Microsoft? You know, what is your preferences? Well, I hinted at it when I said there's only a few three. There's only three percent of the S and P 500 in our cloud stocks. So, so we don't own the big ones. We don't own Microsoft and Amazon. These are what we would call pure play um, stocks, where more than half their business is coming from the cloud. Where they're, so it's a combination of their revenue. It's a combination of are, are they fully in that purely revenue coming from the cloud? Uh, so it is more the the earlier stage companies in that one, uh, and and being fully symbolic of the theme, you know, because people have core exposures to something like the S and P five hundred when they're going for these growth complements. We think you should be pure to that theme. I thoroughly enjoyed a book that you you very much were. Uh did research and helped write with uh, Professor Siegel, Stocks for the Long Run. And I'm thinking about the psychological effect. Uh, you know, in 2008, right after the, the bank crisis, there were people that got, that were in the stock market that probably never got back in, and they missed 14 or so years of great growth. Do you think that there are people that, during this low period right now, that are getting out of the stock market and going, I've... I've lost a lot of money. I'm not going back in. Or do you think that this is not anywhere near the 2008 bank crisis? No, that's a great point. And I think the challenge is, all right, so bond yields have gone up a bit, but still after inflation, very low returns compared to long-term averages. You know, when you think about people say stock markets are expensive after this sort of 10-year bull run. Bond markets are more expensive compared to their history. You were, you know, they've become more positive. The tips yields have been turned into positive from deeply negative territory. Mm-hmm. But you still have a very large equity premium, risk premium, expected returns of stocks versus bonds. So it's a real challenge for retirees who don't have the income that they used to. They're, they're reliant on their their wealth to last their retirement. And so they become more risk averse. It's one of the things that's causing the low bond yields. Um, but we if you can look over the long term um, and 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 when you think about retirement, you do have still a long period of time, um, you know, we would definitely say the 
the portfolios, we would say like a standard 60-40 portfolio should be more like 75-25 stocks versus bonds because of the very low challenging returns on bonds. And, and, and stocks, we think, are better long-term values from where they are today. Even if you have a recession, we think they're better long-term values. Uh, and, and so I think we would say this is definitely different than 2008. You're not going to have the same housing crisis on bank balance sheets that's going to restrict lending. Very, very different place at banks, which led to that crisis. Jeremy, got time for just like one more question. What's the best investment advice were you ever given? You know, I do think Siegel's stocks for the long run has been that advice, um, you know, sort of slow dollar cost averaging into the markets. If you are nervous about where things are, that's one of the other things. Have a plan, stick to it, keep the emotions out of the system so you can systematize as much of those decisions as possible. Um, I think that's been the, the best advice I've been given. Jeremy, thank you so much. Thanks so much for having me. Thanks, Jeremy. Well, if you've got a question about finance or a comment about the show, we'd love to hear from you. Make it pithy, make it concise, and write us at Andre at WallStreetWrapUp.info. And now for a look ahead for the market information for next week. But first, what does the zip in zip code stand for? We've got that answer in just a moment. Well, what does the ZIP and ZIP code stand for? It stands for Zone Improvement Plan. And the ZIP code was introduced on this day, July 1st, 1963, 59 years ago today. Well, this weekend, it's the 4th of July. And for those that will be staying in town and not stranded at the airport, it may include barbecues and grilling and get-togethers. Well, the cost for these enjoyments, they're going to be more expensive this year with inflation. Chicken has gone up 33% per pound from last July 4th, as well as ground beef. Well, you got to have hamburgers, right? Well, that's up 36% from last year. And you have to top it off with dessert. Well, I'll speak for myself, I do. Ice cream has risen on average of 10% from last year. At one time, it was fireworks that was the most expensive item for the 4th of July. Now it's hamburger meat. Maybe it might be cheaper just to have a fifth on the 4th. Well, the first half of the year just ended. And how will the remainder of 2022 look? Well, for the stock market, next week, we'll be talking with Jim Spiro. Jim has been picked by Barron's as one of the top investment advisors in Louisiana. And Forbes magazine has named Jim as the top investment advisor in Louisiana as well. The S&P 500 had its worst first half of the year since 1970, over 50 years. Well, if your 401k is down, well, you're not alone. That's next week. Morgan Stanley's Jim Spiro, all of the market. And by the way, it's Jim Spiro for that. And by the way, I want to mention, too, that all the markets are going to be closed for Monday due to the 4th of July holidays. But let's hope that's not just one day more for the stock market to fall. As a reminder, we repeat the show on Sunday mornings. But the best way, set your DVR so you'll never miss an episode. And that is our show for this Friday, July the 1st, 2022. Hope you've enjoyed it. My thanks so much to Jeremy Schwartz from Wisdom Tree for joining us this evening. But as always, it's you. We appreciate you for allowing us into your homes tonight. Remember, you can always follow us on all the social media, on Facebook, on Meta Platforms, the old YouTube, uh, Facebook, uh, YouTube, Twitter, and WYES.org. So have a great weekend. Have a happy 4th of July. And have a productive week as well. I'll see you next week. For Wall Street Wrap-Up, I'm Andre Laborde. Remember, money never sleeps. Good night. Sponsored by New Orleans Distillers, creators of fine spirits and liqueurs. Through dedication to science, art, and passion, blends of tradition and flavor emerge. For you, always locally crafted. New Orleans Distillers, classically Southern.